A very warm welcome uh, to all of you. This is the uh, second web conference of CIONET International on the uh, topic of uh, fighting Corona with IT. And then I would like to ask Marcus and Paolo to introduce themselves. So we have two very uh, crucial and essential organizations uh, with us here today that are gonna share their experiences uh, with managing and coping with the Corona crisis. So uh, Marcus is from the German Federal Agency uh, of Employment. Uh, so that's a big organization, 100,000 people, 1,500 locations in Germany. And Paolo uh, Magnano, and Marcus is joining us from Nuremberg in Germany. And Paolo is joining us from uh, Milano in, uh, in Italy. And uh, Paolo works for DHL, huge organization, 550,000 people around the globe. Uh, and so, of course, logistics are very crucial in, in, uh, in times of crisis like we have it today. So, Marcus, if you could uh, please maybe uh, start with introducing yourself in a, in a couple of sentences. Then we'll go to the introduction of, uh, of Paolo. And then we will listen to the presentation of, uh, of Marcus first. Please, Marcus. Yes. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me over to this conference. It's a big honor for me. And um, well, my name is Marcus Schmitz. I'm CIO of the Federal Agency of Employment. We are one of the biggest German public insurance companies for the public sector. And uh, our goal basically is to bring people and work together. This is what our main goal is. So we do counseling for young people. We do counseling for people um, uh, who are grown up. We also pay benefits to them if they are unemployed, and we also give advice and uh, payments to uh, employers um, as uh, these days. So this is basically what we are doing. We are having about 100,000 people working for us all over Germany. And as you said, Henrik, we have 1,500 branches and local offices, which are all shut down right now. Okay. Thank you for that introduction. And if you want to learn more about Marcus, we have done... Uh, a, a, a one-hour interview in your uh, lovely office in uh, Nuremberg, uh, Marcus, a couple of months ago. Uh, so right. if you go to uh, cionet.tv, uh, there you can see the interview with, uh, with Marcus, who is also a finalist in the uh, European, European Digital Leader of the Year uh, uh, program that we are running and that we will announce later in June. Paolo, if you could uh, introduce yourselves, uh, please. Yes, yes, uh, with, with pleasure. Uh, I'm Paolo Magnani, I'm uh, the CIO for uh, Melemea. What does it mean? It is a Middle East, it is a Mela Europe, Middle East and Africa for a DHL supply chain. So one of the division of the big group of Deutsche Post DHL. And our, our core business is the contract logistics. So at the end of the day, we are providing our housing and transport services as well we, as uh, value-added services and a lot of other uh, fulfillment uh, services for uh, our customer. Our customer base is not huge like our cuisine of uh, Express. Uh, our customer base is in the, the range of 1,000 uh, customers, not, not more. Uh, we are operating all over the globe in, in, uh, in uh, 200 220 uh, country. In, uh, in Melemea, we are present uh, in 25 uh, countries. Uh, and as I said, uh, we operate uh, uh, the, the service. That service the services that in that particular moment are absolutely fundamental. So, I mean, never before it was so true our uh, way of thinking and uh, that we are an essential part of everyday life. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Is, uh, that is absolutely true. I mean, uh, we are, uh, and it's not only a matter of a safe life as uh, someone is thinking. Uh, I mean, it's not only a matter of a pharmacist, uh, but it's a matter also of food and it's also a matter of uh, serving the right, uh, the right uh, toys for the children that are at home, everything. So everything so that you are looking around you normally is delivered by a logistic operator. And okay. we are the number one logistic operator in the world at the moment in time. And uh, Paolo, you joined us from Milano. I mean, you're in yes, the center yes, of I'm the start home. of Corona in, in Europe. How's the situation yes. today? Yes, yes, I'm at home. Um, uh, and I, I suggest everyone to stay at home. We need to find a way to stop that, uh, that virus. We need to find a way to really 
leave every day the social the social distancing because it's the, we really believe that it is the only way that we can put a stop on on that. Milan at the moment in time is still a great city, still plenty of people that really want to give their own contribution. But I have to admit that it is quite empty. If uh, if you are allowed to go around for some particular reason and you have the permit of doing that, you can really discover a city that uh, yeah you can never see in your life. It's uh, it's amazing. Yeah. It's really amazing. Thank you, Paolo. And uh, so I suggest that Marcus, you. Uh, uh, you kick off this uh, uh, this panel discussion with your presentation. Look, if you could bring up uh, Marcus' slides, and Marcus, you just give a sign to look when he needs to, to go to the uh, to the next slide. And uh, maybe Marcus, you could say, well, what's the situation in Nuremberg with Corona at the moment? Or are well, you in? Well, uh, well, Nuremberg is sort of part of the state of Bavaria, and we were the first state within Germany that had a complete shutdown, and where the schools closed down. And so, since the mid of March, we have uh, a total shutdown of public life in Germany. And what we also see is that sort of the whole economy has come to a, is on hold right now. And uh, so for us sort of what, what um, Paolo has just mentioned, the same is true for, for Nuremberg and Germany overall, that sort of social distancing is now what is crucial for all of us um, to take care of each other and to, um, to really sort of follow the advice of um, of our government just to stay at home. And um, this is one of the biggest challenges for us because our business is a people business. So basically every day, uh, all our employees talk to the people sort of face to face. And by by the mid of, of March, we also closed down all of our 1,500 local offices. And this is sort of the story I can tell to you if you want to. Yes, so um, I just, uh, if, you, if you go to the next slide, you can just see sort of, uh, what the German government has done, they launched very quickly a very, very big program actually for companies and citizens to help them to survive the crisis. And uh, we are actually now um, at the heart of this program because we actually have to, um, to, uh, to do the, the job for, for German government, basically. So the first sort of pillar is that, and this is, might be quite a German um, uh, thing that we have what we call short-term uh, labor uh, allowance so that if companies if they don't want to lay off their people we pay sort of the the money for the people and this is one of the the biggest things right now so we think that we in the course of this year we will pay approximately about 10 billion euros for this short-term work allowance oh. so we are now being flooded by applications of course online and on all the different tracks by employers who actually need help the good thing about this is if they do that, they keep the, the employees in their companies so those people don't get unemployed, which is quite, quite important then when the economy restarts after the crisis. The second thing is, and this is sort of unforeseen in Germany, that small business owners who are usually not eligible to register for unemployment benefits, they now have the possibility, like small business owners, like grocery shop owners and so on, also to register with us and this is sort of a potential customer base of another one million people <laughs> and last but not least of course there is the possibility for everyone to receive unemployment benefits and of course we try to keep the people in the job so for us sort of we have what we call a double challenge and if you if you would sort of move to the next slide uh, this is the biggest difference for me to the last crisis we saw in 2008 and 2009 when we had this big financial crisis with the Lehman things going on, you all remember that. First of all, the external challenges are, I think it's factor five or 10 to what we have seen 10 years ago. So it's not just a matter of the financial industry, it's the whole German economy actually now registering with us. So we see that we have new customer groups and unforeseen customer groups uh, if we compare it to, to the last 10 years. And what is really new about this crisis is that we have got what I would call the internal challenge that, of course, the virus makes people anxious. Our own employees uh, are fearful. They don't know how to cope with that. So it's not that we can just sort of uh, direct our attention to the external challenge. We also have to take care of our customers. And so uh, I think um, the, the uh, IT department has a, new, a totally new role in this crisis to help sort of to, to tackle all these challenges. And I would just give two or three examples of what we are doing right now. 
And if we move to the next slide, you will see sort of that there are the six pillars of sort of the IT program we are running right now is on the left hand side, you see that having shut down all our sort of branches uh, nationwide, we significantly enhance sort of our telephone channel and, and I'll sort of uh, talk a little bit about that later on. The second thing is, of course, we are totally remodeling our online platform. And last time I, when I was uh, sort of joining you in Frankfurt, I talked to you about the agile transformation. And this now helps us to be really quick, sort of to redesign our portal, our online platform. And sort of this is the second thing I'm going to talk uh, to you about. And on the right hand side, you'll see that the second focus for us is sort of to enable our workforce to work remote. And this is sort of one of the biggest programs we have sort of launched in the last three weeks, I have to say. And these are going to be sort of the three things I would like to elaborate a little bit more, if you, if you won't mind. So um, just these three aspects, and we can talk about everything you want later on. So if, you, if we go to, to slide number five, which is quite interesting for us is we have quite a professional call centers, about, uh, I would say, 4,000 people working there every day. Now, three weeks, since the last three weeks, we have now 18,000 people being on the phones. So we have a, quite a brand new Skype for Business platform, but we also have our own sort of telephone platform. And we have sort of, we put all sort of our, our people uh, into these phone sort of circles in order to be able to respond to all the questions those people have. And just to give you a figure, we have every day about 200 to 250,000 calls that are being completed. So this shows you that sort of the whole sort of customer base now is being transformed on the one hand to the telephone channel, which is pretty traditional, but people still in times of a crisis, obviously, they go to that uh, platform. And uh, just to give you an, an, uh, an example, we had a quite interesting sort of pilot projects. Uh, one week ago, my CEO called me and said, well, Marcus, we have a, a new customer base. I talked about these 1.2 million small sort of uh, entrepreneurs. And I said, how do we sort of get aligned to them? And within one week, we built up a Skype response group with 2,000 people from us sort of who are now sort of taking care of this new customer group, which we haven't been in contact beforehand. Mm -hmm. So we did all the online uh, teaching to our sort of 2,000 uh, people working on, on that new platform. And it went live one week after I had that call to my CEO, which is quite interesting. So uh, the new platform now really helps us, but the old platform sort of is also important for us. So just to give you an example, 200 to 250,000 completed calls every day. And it's not getting less, it's sort of getting more and more. The second sort of thing we are doing right now, and this is sort of if we go to the next slide, is that we are now totally sort of uh, reframing our internet portal I printed to you in Frankfurt by the end of February. You can see that um, uh, we organize this platform more alongside to what we call life situations. Uh, like, you know, I get unemployed uh, and I'm looking for a new job. I've got a family and a child is being born. Now sort of the, the basic thing is what is Corona now affecting me? So what we did is we, with the um, marketing and press team, we sat together and within sort of three, four days, we totally remodeled our front page. We put all the e-services to the front page and we have about 800,000 page views every day. So people go there, get the first information, they, they see sort of what they have to do. And German legislation is quite, quite sort of productive right now. So we have new programs every day. And so on a 24 hour basis, we can give them sort of the latest news, what sort of kind of allowance you can re receive, what kind of money you can get where from. And we really see that people really sort of fear that sort of their existence is at risk right now because they don't really don't know where, what, what's going to be within the next uh, weeks and months. So we are now building sort of new online tracks. We have a new e-service for this brand new um, uh, service for the um, uh, mini entrepreneurs. It's going to be live by uh, within two or three weeks from now on. So we are just working on it. And we are now sort of, we had a, hackathon by the federal government and we had a little chatbot we are going to implement by the end of this week. So you see there's a lot of dynamic within the old portal and uh, I'm really glad that we had this relaunch two years ago, otherwise we wouldn't be able to, to react to uh, a crisis like that. So just to give you an example, within the last sort of two weeks we received just from the employers more than 500,000 applications 
for short-term uh, labor allowance. So this is just incredible. I haven't seen an inflow of uh, sort of applications from our employers in, in that dimension for the last 10 years I oversee. And I would just sort of finish with the last sort of thing, which is sort of very dear to me, is how to, we take care of our own employees. And if you uh, go to page number eight, it's quite, for me, quite an interesting thing is in the, in the past times, like remote labor was just something which uh, you discuss with your team lead and we had no more than 2,000 concurrent users on an everyday, on Fridays, 4,000 perhaps. So it was not just much used in the company. And when we saw that the shutdown would be sort of uh, coming, we sat down with the IT team and we said, well, we have to invest into our virtual desk infrastructure. And we ramped it up to 1,500 concurrent users within, I would say, two weeks. So we bought new licenses. We increased the bandwidth from one to 10 uh, gigabyte. We uh, sort of took servers from other sort of server farms, brought them in and Every day since then, we have now today, just, just um, 10 minutes ago, I got the last numbers. Now we have 18,000 people working uh, online remote right now, and then they can do the whole thing. They can work with the whole IT infrastructure, and we provide services from 6 to 10 p.m. every day. So people really start working in the morning from 6 uh, a.m., and we have still three 4,000 people from us working for our customers at 9 p.m., 10 p.m. every day. So you can see that on that platform. And we um, saw that it might uh, take longer. So we bought another sort of 300 servers from Hewlett Packard in the Czech Republic. And we brought them with sort of special transports to, to Nuremberg. And we hope that within the next two or three weeks, we'll be able to host uh, about 46,000 concurrent users. And we had, it was quite a bit sort of, of, a, of, a, of a job to bring all these servers to us, to get them, to get new licenses. And, um, but we think it's really impossible, uh, important because we need to work for our customers. So there's no option really to say that people stay at home and do nothing. And so um, it's quite, quite a bit of a job, but uh, we are quite happy that we're going gonna to manage that. And I've got a great team there doing a fabulous job seven days a week. But I say we haven't experienced a crisis like that um, in the last 10, 20. No one of my colleagues has experienced something like that at the moment. So mm -hmm. uh, we put all sort of our efforts into sort of to make our own uh, employees fit to tackle that crisis. As I said, 18,000 people are on the phone and we sort of uh, put 6,000 people into all these new businesses we have just brought in just to make sure that the employers get their money and that our sort of the people who sort of have the risk of getting unemployed get a good service from us. Yep. So this is just sort of for a, perhaps sort of a first overview of what we are doing right now. And I really have to say is that sort of IT is more and more important in these days because otherwise we couldn't really do our job right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, quite quite impressive, uh, Marcus. Uh, congratulations for the for the work you've done. Um, so you've rolled in 300 servers from the Czech Republic directly into a Nuremberg to install and to make sure that almost half of your uh, workforce will be able to work from home very, very soon. That's right. So we had to, to buy another 25,000 Citrix licenses and we bought these servers because that if they fit very well into our server suite, we are running from that. And uh, so with that one, we can sort of handle the extra 2, 000, uh, 25,000 uh, capacities. Yeah. So I understand that all of a sudden you had many, many more clients. And, and your workforce, um, you closed all your offices yeah. uh, and you had, uh, you had to move as many people as quickly as possible into working from home. And the rest of the people had to work in two shifts, a morning shift and the, the afternoon uh, evening shift so that they're not all at the same time in the office. So that's, that change in a, in a couple of days, couple of weeks is, is quite something. Eh? It is something. It's sort of, we started with our own department. So, um, my partner sort of I'm here now in my office, but sort of 50% of the time I work at home and my sort of my colleagues from the management team do the same thing. And mm -hmm. it works really well and people see it makes sense. Uh, as Paolo said, stay at home and, and sort of the social distancing also has sort of to be in place within our uh, own company. And sort of uh, also our sort of um, trade uh, union representatives, they are very helpful. So they actually took just two days 
to enlarge sort of our uh, office hours from 6 to 10 p.m., which is not usual in the public sector, uh, we have to say. But everyone sees that now it's crucial that we perform, that we do our job, and there's no one really, no one at all, who really sort of complains about a situation like this. I'm doing sort of calls with my team on Saturday, Sundays, at any time, and there's not a single person who has ever said, why uh, do we do this at this time? And even uh, last Saturday, we had a full office day, so the scan cent uh, centers worked, uh, the offices worked, we had a full production day last Saturday. So it's, it's really helpful, and I say sort of the, the, the motivation of our colleagues is really great, I have to say. Okay, super. We will continue the, uh, the discussion in, the, in, in the, the panel after the presentation of uh, Paolo. Look, if you could bring out the, uh, the introduction of, uh, of Paolo, who uh, brought a couple of slides on, uh, on where DHL is, uh, is, is focusing on. Paolo, if you could uh, take it away, please. Yes, uh, I, just, I just have a two slides and a very, very, very short summary because I think that if you wanted to, to understand what we are doing, you need to understand what it is our strategy. And, uh, and then, then let's go directly to the next slide, so you, we, we can we can see. So this one is absolutely the aim and the full condensed strategy of uh, of our group, uh, meaning a group of Deutsche Post DHL group is a group of uh, uh, five hundred fifty thousand people spread all over two hundred and twenty country, and. Uh, Making a rough comparison with the last slide of uh, uh, my colleague uh, Marcus, uh, I mean we are facing more or less the same issue. So I mean we 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 we, have, we were forced to enlarge our bandwidth uh, from eight to twelve gigabyte to twenty eight dot five right now is, uh, and we are to we have to manage one hundred and seventy thousand. Uh, concurrent user in, in the VPN and in Skype and in Teams and in Zoom and so on and so forth. So the technology, the technology issue and the technology challenge that we received was quite high. But uh, in order to understand that, uh, I wanted to, to come back a uh, few minutes, uh, really few minutes, uh, and what it is our purpose, our vision and our value. And at the end, what it is our mission. So you can better uh, uh, picture what, uh, what we are doing. So our purpose at the end is uh, connecting people and improving lives. And as I said, it was uh, never true like, like in this moment. It is really something that is uh, unbelievable true for every one of us. If you go in LinkedIn, for example, and I know that we are streaming in LinkedIn, and you look for all the DHL employee people. I mean, I mean, you don't need to go to and to search for a top management or manager and so on. And you see directly the employee that are posting a video with a big applause of the, the people that are working in the warehouse. I mean, they are staying safe. They are our safety first culture is always present. So we are providing all of the necessary equipment for uh, every one of us. Uh, and uh, we are also inviting the people uh, to respect uh, any regulation and uh, all, uh, all of the dictate that can come from uh, the local uh, rules. But on the other hand, they are extremely motivating in keeping our world uh, running and alive. And uh, so on that, on that respect, our purpose, as I said, is really fantastic. Uh, uh, the vision, uh, being the logistic company of the world uh, and uh, living uh, our uh, value that are respect and uh, result, uh, at that moment in time is really bringing uh, to all of us uh, a big difference in the way of thinking. Because uh, I would like also to change a little bit the point of view. It's not only the technology that, uh, that uh, is a challenge at that moment in time. It's a cultural mind shift that we need to face. So we need to be prepared to work with a team that are remote and we need to, to help our people that, that are in any case working in a physical environment, in a warehouse, in a, in a van, in a truck, and we need to support them in a, in a different way. So we need to live with uh, what, uh, what it is uh, really true at the moment in time, it is that uh, 
we are human beings. We need to stay in touch. We need to stay together. We need to, to have the appraisal of what we are doing. On the other end, the means that we are using uh, normally in the past. So, I mean, having a coffee break, having a, I mean, a shake hand with, uh, with someone, uh, I mean, having, having a dinner together is something that at the moment in time we cannot do. So the technology is, is an enable, uh, in enable for that. And uh, in, the, in, that, um, in that particular uh, moment, uh, our mission that is uh, excellence simply deliver and uh, strengthen the profitable core supported at the group function. Uh, and uh, in summary, leveraging all the digitalization that we have. Uh, so in one motto, delivering excellence in a digital world is something that, uh, as I said, uh, is uh, absolutely true for all of us. So coming in uh, to, to, uh, to the, the challenge that they receive, what we are doing, uh, I mean, uh, and uh, what, uh, how, how we, we are uh, making our, our life better. If you go to the slide, the next slide that I have is exactly that. So we are just making the world a better place. And uh, what are the challenges that we are facing? As I said, that there is the technology part and that is uh, playing an important role, but it is also every single individual uh, with uh, their passion, their, the motivation that they are putting in the team, uh, using uh, all the technologies and stuff uh, to stay together uh, and uh, to really deliver what the, at the end is the final aim that is uh, to serve our customer and at the end uh, to serve ourselves as a customer because we are customers of ourselves and this is quite a unique uh, position for, uh, for all of us. So we, we understand the value of what we are doing uh, just looking at uh, our family, just looking at uh, our relatives uh, and understanding what, what they need uh, and we are doing more than our best to, to serve that. Oh. As I said, it's not easy. I mean, we have a very short time to increase to increase the network mainly that is the big the major challenge, and to put in 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 life and active all the different plan that we have in the past, because we already have a, a disaster recovery response. We already have a pandemic team. We already have a task force task force for the. Um, the, uh, con the continuity plan. Yeah. And uh, so we bring it all these things real and we put in place and uh, we, have, uh, we are exactly putting that in production. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Paolo and uh, Marcus. I, I suggest uh, we have a lot of uh, questions coming in. Luke, maybe you could uh, uh, join us here for a moment and, uh, and, and um, introduce a couple of the first questions for the panel here. So Roger is wondering whether uh, you see a return to normality business as usual uh, post the crisis? Or do you expect um, fundamental change in the organizational structures of your organization? Marcus, how do you see this? this is, are you in a couple of weeks or months going back to working like before? Is this completely gonna change the way that you serve and that you work? Well, I would say that there's definitely going to be a big change. We, we're not going to sort of return to the status quo ante, I would say. Uh, just, just two examples. As I just mentioned, uh, that sort of the investment we are just taking to remote working. I would say this is going to be the future. I mean, we have been very sort of uh, uh, hesitant, I would say, when using sort of rem remote work cap uh, capabilities in the, in the past. I would say this, this won't go away. So um, I, I'm definitely sure that sort of we'll have a discussion within a couple of weeks uh, how sort of to tr transform this into the sort of everyday life of our company. And I'm actually pretty sure that sort of people now see that it works, that it's sort of, we also have about, I think, 1,000 call center agents that do their sort of uh, call center work from home. This wasn't possible last year where we still had the old platform. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think sort of this will uh, help us on the one hand to have sort of another sort of work-life balance proposal for our customer. We have many sort of people who work part-time, so this is very attractive for many people. And sort of for us, sort of, uh, and we'll sort of in the ne next sort of 10 years, we'll have quite a bit of a labor shift sort of within the, our own company. So I would say this will help. Secondly, 
uh, if we see sort of at sort of travel expenses and how we travel and how we meet, it's quite interesting sort of now from our CEO to the counseling officer sort of somewhere in Germany, everyone know how sort of to do Skype conferencing. And when we launched all these projects in the last or two years, it took quite a while to convince people, you know, just do it. It's more efficient. It, it, it's good. It's sort of very effective. And now sort of two or three weeks ago when our old platform sort of had was really under stress, we sort of had a huge sort of increase of sort of Skype calls in that in that sort of in the, these weeks. So I, I think sort of this will sort of totally change the way how we communicate, how we collaborate and sort of how we work sort of in the office and at home. And I think sort of it's going to transform sort of the, the culture of, of our own company uh, to come. I'm, I'm Absolute, convinced. Absolutely. And I, I would like to uh, start the uh, poll number two uh, and now because I think that fits in quite well. So my question is to uh, everybody, all the uh, members that joined here in the Zoom conference, what is the impact of uh, working from home on the uh, productivity of, uh, of your teams, of your IT teams? Do you see a, re uh, a reduction in productivity? Do you see for now, do you see that productivity is the same or do you see that productivity has increased because of uh, working from home? So that's the question and we keep it uh, running for, uh, for a little bit longer. So Paolo, how, how do you look at this? And uh, uh, how do you see the, 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 the before and after? Are we gonna work completely different once they, we have this crisis uh, a bit more under control? Uh, yes, I think I think that there would, there would be a lot of uh, changes, uh, and uh, I explain why. Uh, for example, we are thinking uh, to to launch a uh, completely remote service uh, that is uh, called uh, <laughs> radical remote. And why radical remote? Uh, because uh, inside the IT, uh, we need uh, we need to 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 be really ahead of the curve. And we need to anticipate that kind of needs. So at the moment in time, there are still people that are obliged to stay on the shop floor in our warehouse to help our operation. But the technology that, that we are launching now is something that in the future will arrive. And it's very near, near future. I'm thinking about weeks and months, not year, years. And uh, we can, we can open up, for example, video call. We can open up video chat, we can open up a tool of supporting the people by using a completely remote team. And this is something that uh, that crisis has obliged us to speed up. Because mm -hmm. it was something that we are still thinking, but to be honest, not at that level of speed and not at that pace. So uh, at the end of the day, yes, I think that uh, when we will be back, uh, we will have uh, a much more uh, awareness of what it is uh, using uh, the digital platform. Every one of us, uh, in any case, uh, has been exposed to that. And uh, I mean, also the people on the shop floor, also the people uh, on, uh, on the van, they have experienced a different way of communicating, a different way of being supported. And so at the end, yes, I'm extremely positive on that because I think that we can leverage all this learning and we can, we can really be being disrupting in the future. Absolutely. And we have the results of the poll. 43% of the voters think that productivity has increased. Uh, 38 think it's uh, stayed the same. And 19% uh, said that it uh, reduced. So that's the, uh, so a majority uh, so we overall uh, more increase than a de decrease in uh, productivity. So uh, look, we have another question from the audience, I think. You've both clearly shown in your presentation that you've uh, done a tremendous achievement in terms of uh, managing this crisis and, and scaling up and, and making all of these changes possible. Have you been rewarded by the rest of the organization for this? And has your IT team been uh, put in the spotlight and been rewarded? Actually, yes. Um, we had sort of quite, a, we have every day we have called with the sort of our uh, board directors and with the representatives of our, we call them general directorates. So all those people who are in charge of, let's say, Bavaria, the big sort of German uh, Bundesländer. And actually, we get quite a good feedback because uh, they see sort of how quick we can react. Of course, we 
also make mistakes. Not everything works well, I have to say. This is quite normal in a crisis like this. But for example, we had about 20,000 people who have to do different jobs. And we gave them overnight the rights all to do all these different things, which in normal times takes much more time because we have the whole data protection things and stuff like that. So uh, people see that we sort of can react quite quickly, that we kind of ramp up the um, remote platform. So uh, we got from sort of from all sort of the people working, we are sort of working for sort of our own employees, a very good feedback, but also from sort of the political sphere, from our sort of supervisory board, we had a meeting last week when they really sort of thanked us for the job we are doing. But, um, and especially uh, my team, I have to say, really did a very good job. And, and I wrote to them that this weekend and sort of giving them all the feedback I received over the last days. And I really have to say that, there's, that this is a very big motivation for us to keep on going. Okay, thank you, Marcus. Now, Paula, for, for your team, I mean, how do you make sure that they keep the right motivation? Because, I mean, everybody's under stress uh, and so on. So how do you make sure that they, they need to go the extra mile now? How, how do you manage that? Frankly speaking, I mean, I'm very proud of my team. I mean, uh, it, it was uh, it was uh, something that uh, I was uh, that there was no no formal request to run the additional mile. Everyone understands directly that they have to run the additional mile, miles, and that they they <laughs> they volunteer themselves to do it. So I mean, it, it is a uh, yes. I have to admit that I have a very fantastic team all over uh, all over uh, Milimea. And, and I can say also globally, I mean, I, I, I'm not aware of uh, nobody uh, in, in our organization that was blaming on the fact that we need to work in a very different, a very different and very tough condition. On the other end, uh, coming back to the question of the awards, uh, yes, I mean, uh, there, are, there, are, there are several awards on, on, uh, on that. And it's not only for the, for the IT, for uh, the other staff function. I mean, uh, we are always in, uh, in, in our culture uh, making uh, meeting, uh, a strong race uh, to, to define what it is as the employee of the year, to, the, to define what it is as the best, uh, the best function, what it is as the best department, uh, what it is as the best, uh, at the end of the day, the, 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 the best person all over the, 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 the organization. And uh, yes, I mean, we are using also that, uh, that particular moment of the COVID uh, to have uh, that, uh, that stuff. But uh, yes, we are trying to, to do our best uh, to really promote uh, the, the, the people uh, that, uh, that are helping us, uh, not the HL, but in general the world, uh, to come out uh, to that situation. Okay, great. Look, another question. And now that we've seen that uh, remote work works, uh, will, does that change the opinion on uh, nearshore and offshore working? Well, actually, I think that's sort of uh, more to Paolo to to, uh, to respond to that because from our side is um, is the same question as uh, I saw also sort of whether we can use cloud solutions or not. We have quite we're cl quite a bit restricted sort of by German law to to do sort of uh, near and offshore sort of um, uh, work. So uh, we do, of course, have international suppliers we work very closely with. That for us, sort of, it's not an option, really, sort of, to um, to get sort of IT production somewhere in the Near East or in in uh, in India. Um, uh, this is not an option for us, and sort of, we are, have a lot of restriction when it comes to use sort of cloud products. Also, so, yeah. um, so that that sort of uh, the German sort of data protection law, which is not sort of that that liberal in that respect. So actually, uh, it would have have helped in some respect, but it's not an option for us right now. Okay, Paolo, and they... There is no change on that respect for us. There is absolutely no change on that. We are always using offshore services as well as inshore and as well as in-house. So at the, end, at the end of the history, I mean, there is zero change in, in, in our strategy. We need to retain the best people in our organization. On the other end, we need also to be flexible enough to manage the peaks by having uh, by having uh, some uh, some offshore team or uh, some other uh, some other uh, company that help help us on uh, on that respect, but uh, yeah, it's not it's not that that uh, that emergency that change our strategy at all. I mean, uh, we we go ahead with the strategy that we have in the past. Okay, great. I would like to uh, run a second poll here for the people that joined in the uh, Zoom conference, and the question is: now that we are in this uh, Corona crisis. 
has your budget, has that changed your budget for the next three months? Is, is that seriously reduced? Is it going down with more than 20%? Has it reduced with 20, 0 to 20%? Has it stayed the same or has it increased because you have to do more? And has it increased normal 0 to 20 or seriously increased? Now we keep that poll running and, uh, and maybe we can talk a little bit about budgets in uh, in, in your government organization, budgets today are, there's plenty of budget, I can imagine, Marcus. Well, actually, as, um, as I said, is, um, my budget is still the same, so it hasn't increased. <laughs> Not that I know, actually. Uh, okay. But we're actually trying sort of to work with the budget we are having. We are now, of course, redirecting resources into these topics. But uh, sort of, I really want to wait and see because we are not doing other things at the same time. So I think we should be fine in the end overall, but we'll just have uh, different priorities in the next months to come. And this is okay, I think. So we, we have to reprioritize things. We sort of uh, redirect resources from projects to the corona topics we are now sort of investing on. But I think that's okay. So I think overall we'll be more or less sort of, I, myself, I will have the same budget. But sort of seen from the public uh, federal agency of employment, of course, we have sort of, as I said, sort of we have uh, a budget for bad times. I always say it's 26 billion euros. We have saved over the last 10 years just for crises like this. And it's quite interesting because one or two years ago, we had a big political discussion in Germany. Why does the federal agency need sort of a budget as a reserve in, in that respect? Because the last crisis was 10 years ago and it was a long time ago. And now I think everyone in Germany is glad that sort of the social insurance as we are has reserves of 27 or 28 billion euros. So uh, we have now redirected 10 billion just to make sure that we can pay all the new sort of uh, allowances I've just mentioned. But um, it's not going to be redirected to the IT budget, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Paolo, how is, how is your IT budget looking in the short term? Is is the same. Is the same. Okay. Uh, yeah. is, is absolutely the same. We have we have managing a different priority. That's right. As mm -hmm. I said, I mean we are trying to change the pace. So at the end of the day, strategy priority uh, things that we are doing are more or less the same. But the speed and the pace in some particular uh, uh, topic is changed. At the end, that one is in a nutshell what, what is going on. And, and, and this is also reflected in the business because we cannot say that uh, the requirement at that moment in time of the healthcare sector are the same of the automotive one. Right. Right? For example, in the automotive, there that, that was some side that the government decided to switch off. So at the end of the day, why we need to go, go, go in ahead in making the IT changes for that particular plant if we know that that particular plant will be closed down for the next couple of weeks. So at the end, I mean, we tactically move the people and the support uh, uh, to, the, to the, the sector that are still pumping up a really a lot of volume. Mm -hmm. and, and then we are phasing out a little bit the support from the, the sector that are, in any case, in a, in a small regression. That, that is what we are doing. But at the end, in terms of budget, it is, is exactly the same. Okay. The results of the poll are that about half of uh, the people that joined the voting, the budget stays the same. One quarter, the uh, budget uh, has increased. And, uh, and, and the rest of the people, the, the budget has already reduced. I think it's very dependent on the kind of uh, sector that you're in. And you're both in very crucial, very business uh, sectors. can imagine if you're in hospitality or in, in travel that your budgets have been cut dramatically uh, already. So, Luke, do we have uh, um, more questions from, uh, from the audience? I see that the, the chat is, uh, is, is quite busy and a lot of uh, questions are coming in. Um, I think um, most of the topics have, have already been addressed. I think there's still a major theme on the, the mindset and uh, the psychology of people now working at home full time uh, with their children and their partners, often in the same house, sometimes in small spaces. So when you talk to your people uh, on a more one-to-one -one basis, what's the overall feeling? Are they doing well? Are they happy? Are they sad? Are they... Uh, regretting that they only have 500 steps in a day what's happening well i think there's sort of uh, it's a very sort of diverse picture uh, i have to draw on the one hand of course all those colleagues who have a, i would say chronic 
uh, illness, something like that, they're really happy to stay at home and work from there. Doesn't matter sort of how the situation is at home. For people who uh, have to take care of their children, including myself, it's not sort of, uh, it's, 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 it's a different sort of way if you do it every day. So I think we'll have a discussion on what is the right balance and sort of what is the right balance between sort of working in on offsite and sort of what is the, the optimal point of a good productivity and sort of also for the well-being of, of uh, my colleagues. So I think sort of um, what I see is right now is that many people sort of really sort of feel the loss of social contact. So coming in and sort of being at work, also having sort of the social distance there as well, we can see that people really sort of uh, really like sort of to, to be a little bit more in touch. So I think sort of the 100% remote work is not going to be an option. And that's, I would say also why our customers call us on the phone because we do have e-services, but I really have the impression that they at some point really want to talk to a person, to a human being, not to a chatbot. And uh, so this is quite interesting. I think this is sort of true for our own employees in the same way as it's true for our customers. So as always, it's the right balance that we have to figure out after the crisis is over, I have to say. Okay. And Paolo, I mean, you, are, you run an IT team of about 350 people that are spread in different regions all over the Middle East, Africa, and, and, and mainland Europe. H how do you keep your people happy? And, and, and do you see difference in how people react in the north and in the south, for instance? Or? No, no, I don't think that there is any difference between the north, the south, the, the Middle East, the Mediterranean area, or, uh, or the Africa. No, I don't think that is that one. What I miss personally, I miss, uh, I miss the, 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 the possibility to take a plane and to spend some days with, uh, with all the people and enjoy the fact that, uh, yes, we work, we visit the plan, we make all the status of different projects that we have, uh, but we have also some good fun together uh, in the evening. Uh, so we, we organize normally something that, uh, yes, is a sort of... Uh, as you can call it, team building activity that in any case are, uh, are really good. And in that particular period, you cannot have that. Uh, I have tried personally to have a sort of a virtual aperitif in the evening and see how, we, how it is working. It was not bad, but I have to admit that it is not the same. Uh, is, uh, the, 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 the mood in any case is not the same. In terms of motivation, as I said, I'm really proud and really happy about the team because, uh, yes, I don't think that at that moment in time uh, my team has a problem in the, the motivation. I think uh, that uh, they, need, they, they feel in any case appreciated and they feel uh, that they can raise his hand. Uh, we are always 100% uh, reachable, 7% 7 times, times 7. So it is a, it, it's really not a problem that they, they reach someone. Yes, uh, yes, let me say, is an issue what you can do together that, uh, yeah, it's not the same. Okay, I'm going to launch uh, uh, the, the third and last poll. And the question in this poll is, how do you expect the market share of your company to evolve as a result of this corona crisis? Do you think it will stay the same? Will uh, the relative market share of your company, will it go down or will it increase? Uh, and, and so let's talk um, while we run this because uh, every crisis uh, can be an opportunity as well. And, and of course it's different in, in a government organization than uh, in, in a commercial organization. But let's talk about innovation and how a crisis uh, allows organizations to kind of reinvent themselves and, and, and to make uh, a difference compared to the competition. How do you look at that, Marcus? Is, is this crisis an opportunity yeah. for innovation? I, I would definitely say yes. I mean, it's the same when I remember sort of when we had the so-called refugee crisis some years ago. This was a time when we had a lot of innovation within our companies, when we had of developed sort of core data systems between the public service agents, which was never possible in, in other circumstances. And uh, this time again, I mean, we have just started. We're just sort of in the beginning, I would say. We're not uh, through the whole thing. But I can see that sort of we have started sort of to, to uh, elaborate on things which speed wise, but also from the sort of innovativeness scene is I think new. So we are now sort of, for example, uh, experimenting with sort of chatbot solutions. We are now sort of um, uh, experimenting on sort of RPA solutions. We are thinking about having a new way of 
video um, identification because people can come into the offices. So this speeds up innovation. And I would say definitely also for the public sector, this helps sort of to, to take up speed. And I hope so that we'll see some really innovative solutions within the next weeks, which would have taken perhaps one or two years in normal times because it's so complicated to get all the people on board, all the different institutions. So this really speeds up right now. Okay. And I think the, uh, the, the audience that we have in this conference is quite positive. I mean, 40% think that they, this is an opportunity to increase market share, 40% think it will stay the same and 20% uh, are afraid that um, their market share will uh, decrease. Look, we have time for one uh, more last question uh, from the audience. I think as a final question uh, from the audience, uh, they're wondering, you've heavily invested probably in the preparation of business continuity plans uh, and business continuity management. Did it help? Did it actually work? Yes, absolutely. I can confirm that, that, that it is absolutely something that it was a perfectly proved to work. I mean, the continuity, the business continuity plan, it was uh, something that it was uh, much more than the pure IT support. Uh, it was uh, something that it, it was uh, spread all over every single department of the organization. So for the finance, uh, for the HR, uh, for the operational excellence, as well as in the operation. So also the site leader, uh, he was prepared to split the teams uh, by color, for example, uh, red, uh, blue, yellow, green, in order to avoid the continuity contamination from one team to another one. So all, all this kind of culture, all that kind of business continuity, yes. We were prepared and uh, yes, it was, uh, it, was, it was not easy at, at the end of the day to turn the key because everyone was uh, still thinking, yes, but is it the right moment to turn the key? Yes, it is. And, uh, yeah, and then it was, at the end, it was quite smooth too. When, did the, when we decided, it was quite smooth. Okay, thank you, Paolo. Marcus? Yeah, we, of course, also had business continuity plans. I would say they were a good starting point, yes. But on the other hand, I think uh, all those people who wrote these plans didn't actually think of a crisis like this, I have to say. So it was a good starting point, yes. But for me, crucial really is the people who manage these plans and the team, the management team you have, the people who are sort of working on your team. I think this is crucial. And so in, in, I would say, yes, it was a good starting point. But now it's much more important that we have got the right team working on the topics and, and this helps most. Okay, great. And with that, we are approaching the end of, uh, of the hour and uh, we've learned that in uh, virtual conferences and meeting, uh, punctuality and timekeeping is important. Yeah. So, uh, Marcus, uh, thank you so, so much for, uh, for sharing our experiences. Paolo, thank you so much Pleasure. for uh, you. for sharing your insights. Uh, thank you both for taking the time in your very, very busy uh, schedules uh, to be with us. Look, if we um, could uh, bring up the last couple of slides, a couple of messages uh, for, uh, for everybody. Um, as a community, CIO Net, we're really stepping up and, and our, um, we see our role as, uh, as, as doing what we are doing now, and that is exchanging experiences, exchanging best practices, making connections within, uh, within the community. And so we do this every two weeks uh, on an international and, an, and in an open way. But on a country level, there's a lot of, um, a lot of things going on uh, in the different countries here. You, for instance, you see an overview of the, uh, uh, of the things that are happening in Spain, in Belgium, in Italy, in Poland, and, uh, and, and so on, in Germany. So many, uh, many activities uh, going on there. So if you're a CRNAP member, you will be invited to, uh, to local uh, events like these in the future as well. And so if you want to join the next uh, international, uh, CRNet International Web Conference on uh, fighting corona with IT, then I invite you in exactly two weeks. And there we have uh, three CIOs uh, lined up um, with um, uh, the CIO of Mars, uh, Mayo Song, uh, will be there. We have Lawrence, who's the, uh, the REG CIO, the uh, government CIO of, uh, of the Netherlands. And we have uh, Christina Alvarez uh, from uh, CIO from Santander Bank in, uh, in, in Spain. And so there will, uh, we will be two weeks ahead. The, we will be in a new situation. Uh, and so we will be learning uh, how they are coping and uh, managing this. So a couple of uh, call to actions, if we go to the next slide, for all of you. Uh, so please join us in the next uh, web conference on the 22nd of April, the international one. Um, collaborate and join the local ones. Uh, if you are uh, following this on LinkedIn 
and you are a digital leader and you have not joined our community uh, yet, please go to crnet.com and you can uh, request to join there, just fill in. We've got a chatbot running, uh, so uh, that's very, very easy to become a member. Uh, if you want to learn more about uh, some of the top CIOs around Europe, how they are, um, uh, how they are really um, uh, personalizing uh, digital leadership, then please go to CRNet uh, TV. Uh, CRNet.tv will bring you to uh, YouTube. We've got a, quite an impressive library there of, uh, of interviews with CIOs from, uh, from around Europe. And of course, follow us on, uh, on LinkedIn as well. Go to our company page. Uh, and so with that, I would like to thank Paolo and Marcus. Uh, it was really, really a pleasure. Thanks you. Thank you for your time. Thank and you. I would, thank you, Paolo. Thank, thank you, you thank Marcus. You. All the best to you. And so with that, I would like to thank all the participants and everybody that was here. And we're going to end with a small video explaining a little bit more what CIONet TV is all about. So thank you and see you very, very soon. For the last 15 years, I've been on a quest to discover the DNA of the most successful digital leaders in the world. What makes them tick, what's in their minds and in their hearts. We are sharing deep insights from our world-class CIOs so that you get inspired, can learn and reach your full potential as a digital leader. If you are an ambitious technology executive, then I invite you to join CIONet. Join our community so that you too can realize your ambitions.